Fifteen! Black hair and grey hound. It was the crudest possible forgery. Bond leapt for the Bentley, blessing the impulse which had made him drive it over after dinner. With the choke full out, the engine answered at once to the starter and the roar drowned the faltering words of the commissionaire who jumped aside as the rear wheels whipped gravel at his piped trouser legs. As the car rocked to the left outside the gate, Bond ruefully longed for the front-wheel drive and low chassis of the Citroën. Then he went fast through the gears and settled himself for the pursuit, briefly savoring the echo of the huge exhaust as it came back at him from either side of the short main street through the town. Soon he was out on the coast road, a broad highway through the sand dunes which he knew from his morning's drive had an excellent service and was well cat-sied on the bends. He pushed the revs up and up, hurrying the car to 80, then to 90, his huge Markle headlights boring a safe white tunnel nearly half a mile long between the walls of the night. He knew the Citroën must have come this way. He had heard the exhaust penetrate beyond the town, and a little dust still hung on the bends. He hoped soon to see a distant shaft of its headlights. The night was still and clear. Only out at sea there must be a light summer mist, for at intervals he could hear the foghorns lowing like iron cattle down the coast. As he drove, whipping the car faster and faster through the night, with the other half of his mind he cursed Vesper and M for having sent her on the job. This was just what he had been afraid of, these blithering women who thought they could do a man's work. Why the hell couldn't they stay at home and mind their pots and pans and stick to their frocks and gossip and leave men's work to the men? And now for this to happen to him, just when the job had come off so beautifully! For Vesper to fall for an old trick like that and get herself snatched and probably held to ransom like some bloody heroine in a strip cartoon. The silly bitch. Bond boiled at the thought of the fix he was in. Of course, the idea was a straight swap. The girl against his check for 40 million. Well, he wouldn't play. Wouldn't think of playing. She was in the service and knew what she was up against. He wouldn't even ask M. The job was more important than her. It was just too bad. She was a fine girl, but he wasn't going to fall for this childish trick. No dice. He would try and catch the Citroën and shoot it out with them, and if she got shot in the process, that was too bad too. He would have done his stuff, tried to rescue her before they got off to some hideout. But if he didn't catch up with them, he would get back to the hotel and go to sleep and say no more about it. The next morning, he would ask Mathis what had happened to her and show him the note. If the chief put the touch on Bond for the money in exchange for the girl, Bond would do nothing and tell no one. The girl would just have to take it. If the commissioner came along with the story of what he had seen, Bond would bluff it out by saying he had had a drunken row with the girl. Bond's mind raged furiously on with the problem as he flung the great car down the coast road, automatically taking the curves and watching out for carts or cyclists on their way into Royale. On straight stretches, the Amherst VA superchargers dug spurs into the Bentley's 25 horses and the engine sent a high-pitched scream of pain into the night. Then the revolutions mounted until he was past 110 and onto the 120 mile per hour mark on the speedometer. He knew he must be gaining fast. Loaded as she was, the Citroën could hardly better 80, even on this road. On an impulse, he slowed down to 70, turned on his fog lights, and doused the twin Markles. Sure enough, without the blinding curtain of his own lights, he could see the glow of another car a mile or two down the coast. He felt under the dashboard and from a concealed holster took out a Colt Army Special 45 and laid it on the seat beside him. With this, if he was lucky with the service of the road, he could hope to get their tires or their petrol tank at anything up to a hundred yards. Then he switched on the big lights again and screamed off in pursuit. He felt calm and at ease. The problem of Vesper's life was a problem no longer. His face in the blue light from the dashboard was grim, but serene. Ahead in the Citroën, there were three men and the girl. The chief was driving, his big fluid body hunched forward, his hands light and delicate on the wheel. Besides sat the squat man who had carried the stick in the casino. In his left hand, he grasped a thick lever which protruded beside him almost level with the floor. It might have been a lever to adjust the driving seat. In the back seat was the tall, thin gunman. He lay back relaxed, gazing at the ceiling, apparently uninterested in the wild speed of the car. His right hand lay caressingly on Vesper's left thigh, which stretched out naked beside him. Apart from her legs, which were naked to the hips, Vesper was only a parcel. Her long black velvet skirt had been lifted over her arms and head and tied above her head with a piece of rope. Where her face was, a small gap had been torn in the velvet so that she could breathe. She was not bound in any other way, and she lay quiet, her body moving sluggishly with the swaying of the car. The chief was concentrating half on the road ahead and half on the onrushing glare of Bond's headlights in the driving mirror. He seemed undisturbed when not more than a mile separated the hare from the hounds, and he even brought the car down from 80 to 60 miles an hour. Now, as he swept round a bend, he slowed down still further. A few hundred yards ahead, a Michelin post showed where there was a small parochial road crossing with the highway. Attention, he said sharply to the man beside him. The man's hands tightened on the lever. A hundred yards from the crossroads, he slowed to 30. In the mirror, Bond's great headlights were lighting up the bend. The shift seemed to make up his mind. Allez! The man beside him pulled the lever sharply upwards. The boot at the back of the car yawned open like a whale's mouth. There was a tinkling clatter on the road, and then a rhythmic jangling as if the car was towing lengths of chain behind it. Hoop it! The man depressed the lever sharply, and the jangling stopped with a final clatter. The chief glanced again in the mirror. Bond's car was just entering the bend. 
that you've made a racing change and threw the Citroën left-handed down the narrow side road, at the same time dousing his lights. He stopped the car with a jerk and all three men got swiftly out and doubled back under the cover of a low hedge to the crossroads, now fiercely illuminated by the lights of the Bentley. Each of them carried a revolver and the thin man also had what looked like a large black egg in his right hand. The Bentley screamed down towards them like an express train.